Welcome to this presentation titled The Legacy of the Vanderbilt Family Acquisitiveness. My name is Edward J. Dodson and I've prepared this presentation after a visit to the Biltmore Estate located outside of Asheville, North Carolina. I hope you'll enjoy what I have to say. The Vanderbilt name has been among the small list of leading American dynasties for almost two centuries. As described by Lewis F. Post in the Single Tax Review, they sit at the top of a complex web of entrenched privilege that both dominates and undermines social, political, and economic conditions existing in the United States of America. Post writes, And who are this class? If it consisted only of the great privileged, it might be ignored. But the great privileged, few though they are, hold master keys. They cooperate with those of minor privileges. They bargain with politicians and command pulpits. They own newspapers and judges and prosecuting attorneys. And they intimidate right and left. They dictate the public opinion of business centers. They coerce the timid. They befuddle the confiding. And they bribe the sordid. Not by stimulating class consciousness, but by exciting individual selfishness, they draw to their support a great social force and divide opposition. They perpetuate their own privilege in industry and their own power in affairs. These are the methods whereby a class war is being precipitated, and this is the class that is bringing the classes into collision. This was, after all, what historians began to describe as the Gilded Age. What follows is the story of how a few of the heirs to the huge fortune acquired by Cornelius Vanderbilt lived and are living today. Cornelius acquired this fortune during the 19th century, building a transatlantic steamship line and later investing in railroads that crisscrossed the North American landscape. Along the way, Cornelius and his descendants also acquired huge land holdings and paid for the construction of countless mansions, the eventual disposal of which seemed to have added even more wealth passed on to successive generations. Matthew Josephson in The Robber Barons provided this insight into his character. He was prudent as well as bold. He would invest neither in steamships nor in steam locomotives in their pioneering stage. But once he had judged an affair to be in the fruitful stage, once entered upon it, he drove himself, men and things, with reckless energy and with an indifference to establish custom and law which stood him in good stead. A year after the death of his wife Sophia in 1868, Cornelius married a cousin from Mobile, Alabama who got him to donate $1 million for the founding of Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Most of his $105 million estate, equal to over $140 billion in today's money, was left to his son, William Henry, whose four sons were destined to inherit most of this wealth. William had this 24-room farmhouse constructed in New Dorp, Staten Island, around 1850 on land given to him by his father and where he was able to turn the family farm into a profitable endeavor. Around 1864, William joined his father in the railroad business, but held on to the property as a country home. William's son, George Washington Vanderbilt, took over management of the family farm once his father became active in the railroad business. An army airfield occupied part of the farm from 1919 through 1969, when the land became part of the Gateway National Recreation Area. The will of Cornelius immediately gave $5 million to his grandson Cornelius II and $2 million each to three other grandsons, William Cassam, Frederick William, and George Washington Vanderbilt. William Cassam Vanderbilt had this mansion constructed in 1905 on a lot at 660 Fifth Avenue in New York City. The mansion was torn down in 1925 to make way for a 20-story commercial building. 
This 54-room mansion in Hyde Park, New York, was constructed by Frederick William Vanderbilt between 1896 and 1899. The site originally included 600 acres of land on a bluff overlooking the Hudson River. Today, the property is owned and operated by the National Park Service. William Henry Vanderbilt married early at age 19. As noted above, he was assigned responsibility for the family farm by his father, who initially thought his son had no instinct for business. By the time of his death in 1885, he had doubled the family fortune to over $200 million, $5.7 billion in today's money. William's Manhattan mansion, called the Triple Palace, was finished just three years before his death in 1885. The residence consisted of 58 rooms, including a three-story art gallery with a large skylight. The northern portion of the mansion was demolished in 1927. The southern section was destroyed in 1947. New high-rise buildings were constructed on the site. William also owned an 800-acre country estate on Long Island and this mansion in Newport, Rhode Island. William's two eldest sons, Cornelius II and William Cassam, inherited the bulk of William's estate. Cornelius Vanderbilt II lived in this mansion on 57th Street and 5th Avenue in New York City. As with almost all of these Victorian-era mansions, this one was eventually demolished. This is William Cassam's townhouse at 665th Avenue in New York, which remained in the family until 1926, when it was demolished. George Washington Vanderbilt, the youngest son, had received $1 million on his 21st birthday and another $5 million under his father's will, added to which was the income generated from a $5 million trust fund. George Washington Vanderbilt continued to live with his mother until completion of his own townhouse located at 9 West 53rd Street in Manhattan. The townhouse was completed in 1887 and was eventually demolished. The family also owned two additional re residences in Manhattan at 645 and 647 Fifth Avenue. This photograph is of the building at 645 Fifth Avenue, demolished in the 1970s. George lived the life of a true gentleman. He had no responsibilities in the family businesses, so he spent much of his time at intellectual pursuits. He married Edith Dresser in 1896. A daughter, Cornelia, was born in 1900. In 1888, George acquired 100,000 acres of land near Asheville, North Carolina. He then hired the architect Richard Morris Hunt to build a massive limestone mansion in the style of a European chateau. The mansion, completed in 1895, contains nearly four acres of floor space. It features 35 bedrooms, 43 bathrooms, 65 fireplaces, this indoor swimming pool, empty for many years because of a problem with leakage, and a bowling alley where servants retrieve the balls and reset the pins. The cost of running and maintaining the estate forced George to carve out 87,000 acres of land for sale to the United States Forestry Service. However, before the sale could be finalized, George suddenly died due to complications from an appendectomy. George's widow, Edith, also sold off other assets, including the Biltmore Estate Industries and the Biltmore Village. She remained in the mansion intermittently for several more years. Their daughter, Cornelia, married John F. A. Cecil in 1924, and in 1930 they opened the mansion to the public at the request of Asheville civic leaders, hoping the mansion would attract tourists to the region. Unfortunately, the Great Depression was about to hit the entire nation's economy. The Biltmore was closed during the Second World War. For several years, many precious works of art from the National Gallery of Art were stored there. 
Cornelius and John's oldest son, George H. Vanderbilt Cecil, was the last family member to live on the property. He left in 1956. His son, William Amherst Vanderbilt Cecil, took over management of the Biltmore estate through his firm, the Biltmore Company. Some 1.5 million people visit the estate annually, contributing importantly to the Asheville regional economy. The Biltmore Company is today taking in over $200 million in revenue annually. The company employs 2,400 people. In addition to the huge mansion and the surrounding acreage, the Biltmore Company owns a hotel, a winery, restaurants, and shops. So how does one think about the legacy of the Vanderbilt's fortune and the pattern of spending that in many ways exceeded any ostentatious display of personal wealth of the most aristocratic old world landed interests? In Frederick Lewis Allen's book, The Lords of Creation, he places the Vanderbilts into what seems to be their rightful place in that period described as the Gilded Age. He writes, in the early years of the 20th century, the Vanderbilts were the most glitteringly fashionable family in the United States. Carrying on the campaign for economic justice initiated in the 1880s by his father, Henry George Jr. provided the public with an examination of the state of democracy in America in the book, The Menace of Privilege, published in 1906. The depth of privilege was, he argued, corrosive to democracy and to the lives of those who enjoyed such privilege. Henry George Jr. wrote, Just as privilege is not normal, so the preeminence to which it raises its owners is not normal. Indeed, there is something abnormal about the lives of the owners of privilege at every turn. There is a right way for the individual to live and a wrong way. There are natural physical and moral laws which he perceives and which he realizes he must not transgress. The rules for this spiritual peace and happiness are few, simple, and obvious. And so I leave it to the viewers of this presentation to determine for yourself what the legacy of the Vanderbilt fortunes is. Is it on the whole constructive? even though characterized by ostentatious display of personal wealth and whether or not that wealth was legitimately acquired or acquired because the laws permitted entrenched privilege to prevail. This is the question that we must ask ourselves about our heritage and about what we should do in the future to ensure that this level of privilege is no longer permitted. Thank you.